God bless you. This is Rosemary Santiago from On Wings of an Eagle. Uh, today we are we're going to be speaking on the tabernacle, and uh, there's going to be quite a quite a bit of explaining here. But they have the most incredible uh, clues on why God does what He does. I mean, it's not just in there. He doesn't throw things. He doesn't shake it up. And it comes out like if you were rolling dice. It's not that type of. He is very specific about the way he wants things done. And there's always a reason for it. And I know you're going to enjoy this. So Father, in the name of Jesus, I give you thanks, Lord. I ask, Lord, that you may glorify yourself like always. We need your presence, Lord. We need to be able to understand your word. We need to understand that the reason why you speak the things you speak, Lord, or have allowed by the inspiration of your Holy Spirit for these things to be there is for us to connect in these times. Even though those were ancient times, they had different customs, Lord, but it all turns out to be the same thing for your honor and glory your son and your holy spirit i give you thanks father in jesus mighty name so briefly and this is an express at the very beginning uh for you to understand why the the nation of israel first of all there were 70 nations genesis 10 speaks on it the genealogy then it takes us to the tower of babel chapter 11 where those nations they decided that they were going to do things their way like always humans have a tendency to forget that there is a almighty god omnipresent omnipotent omniscient sovereign he's the one that that uh tells you this is the way i want things done so then we get from uh, chapter 12, Abram to Abraham. He's an elderly person, so's his wife, but the Lord makes a promise to them. Both of them end up uh, laughing about it, and Isaac is his name. And uh, he was no joke, but he definitely was laughed. He was a promised child. Then we go to Genesis 21, where... Isaac uh, gets uh, a, a wife, and then there's a struggle. She gets two children. They're struggling even from the very womb. They're struggling for the position, but God had already told her that Jacob, the, the, the younger one, was going to have the blessing. Then we go to Genesis 25, and that's... Jacob now takes on, and of course, because of his, uh, how would you say, uh, the little plan between his mother and himself, uh, he had to pay for it in a way because of Laban, his uncle, who, um, who tricked him. And he tricked him first with the first wife. He was thinking that he was going to get uh, Rachel, and he ends up getting Leia, maybe not so beautiful, but uh, apparently very, very beautiful eyes. And there's this thing where all of a sudden um, Rachel gets a little bit on the envious side. She's She doesn't see anything about her. So um, they use their servants. It is an amazing uh, custom in those times. They were allowed to take their maidservants or their uh, their servants to to have a child in their name when they were sterile. So finally, at the very end, uh, Rachel gets her her Joseph and her uh, Benjamin. Though the uh, midwife was going to call her child Benoni because it was in pain and and she had parted, her soul had parted from her. Her husband said, no, his name is going to be Benjamin. So now let's look at the sons of Jacob. 
that would be Genesis 29 and 30. Genesis 29 and 30. So you can get an idea. Okay. And we have not too many illustrations today of visuals, but we're going to hold it to the very end. It's going to be very interesting for you to see. But I'm going to read the, the, the blessings. Okay. This is where at the very end. And you'll get to see it. Let me go on. Let me go on to Exodus 1. Just telling the story. So we get the idea where Joseph is not known by the uh, following Pharaoh. And then we find in Exodus 1, the Israelites are in bondage. Now, we know that Moses comes out of that line and he's already uh, been infiltrated by the Lord into Egypt with a very, very big mission. One that he didn't want. Like a lot of us, once God uh, has a calling for us, we kind of like shy away from it and we give all kinds of excuses. So we have Exodus chapter 3 and here's his uh the uh dialogue with the lord okay now moses kept the flock of jethro his father-in-law the priest of midian and he led the flock to the backside of the desert and came to the mountain of God, even to Oreb. And the angel of the Lord appeared unto him. That is the angel of Yehovah. It wasn't just any. In a flame of fire out of the midst of a bush. And he looked and behold, the bush burned with fire and the bush was not consumed. And Moses said, I will now turn aside and see this great sight, why the bush is not burnt. And when the Lord saw that, he turned aside to see God, called unto him out of the midst of the bush, and said, Moses, Moses. And he said, Here am I. He said, Draw not nigh or hither. Put off thy shoes from off thy feet, for the place wherein thou standest is holy ground. So, you know, he introduces himself here on um, where he's uh, basically he's debating and uh, acting more like a lawyer. Why he should not be the one to go and bring this message right to, uh, to, uh, to the Israel Israelites. But the Lord says, And Moses said unto God, Behold, when I come unto the children of Israel and shall say unto them, The God of your fathers has sent me unto you. And they shall say to me, What is his name? What shall I say unto them? And God said unto Moses, I am that I am. That's how the word is Hayat. And he said, Thus shalt thou say unto the children of Israel. In chapter 6, he has a very interesting uh, conversation. It says, Then the Lord said unto Moses, Now shalt thou see what I will do to Pharaoh. Um, for with a strong hand shall he let them go, and with a strong hand shall he drive them out of his land. And God spake unto Moses and said unto him, I am the Lord. That's El Shaddai. It says, And I appeared unto Abraham, unto Isaac, and unto Jacob by the name of God Almighty. But by my name, Yehovah, was I not known to them. So now he's really revealing 
M cell. Let's see. Chapter 13. 21 and 22. Title here is The Burning Bush or The Burning Pillar. And it says, in the name of the Father, the Son, and Holy Spirit. And the Lord went before them by day in a pillar of a cloud to lead them the way, and by night in a pillar of fire to give them light to go by day and night. So I had put down something, something very interesting. Um, okay, it says... By night in a pillar of fire to give them light, leading the people through the wilderness with his protective presence, knowing the long journey through the desert wilderness would be exhausting so as to assure them that he was always with them. That's a promise also in Isaiah uh, 43, 2, that he promises to be with us, uh, whatever we're going through. And he symbolically says, if you're going through the waters, the rivers, the fire and also the desert because he walked them all the years in the desert trying to have these people disciplined. And I know that God has to deal with us, disciplining us, uh, you know, chewing some time our ear. You're doing this wrong. You feel the presence of the Holy Spirit telling you, admonishing. This has to be done this way. Um, but the interesting thing was a commentary. Uh, it it drew my attention. Um, it says that that um, that it is believed that while the pillar of cloud shaded the people from the intense desert sun, it also contained droplets of moisture which refreshed the travelers and their livestock. The pillar of fire at night provided light and warmth in in if there was no wood available for fires I, I i thought that that was very interesting i like um the strategy god is a a a warrior in here it says when the people were waiting to cross the red sea the pillar of cloud moved behind them blocking the egyptian army from attacking he gave them light from the cloud, but darkness to the Egyptians. You can find that in Exodus 14, 19 to 20, verse 24, all the way to 28. Now the cloud, it came down on the, on, on the tent of meeting and the glory of the Lord filled the desert tabernacle. That must have been awesome. I've been wanting to find uh, a poster. I used to have a poster of, of, of that scene. Uh, whoever came out with that, it's, it's awesome. Uh, it was, it took up almost a whole wall. And every time I looked at it, it felt like if I was really there in the desert with them. It says, when the cloud covered the tent of meeting, the Israelites encamped. When the cloud lifted, they moved. Here, Exodus chapter 33. I like the, the, the very last one 33 9 to 10 and it came to pass as Moses entered into the tabernacle the cloudy pillar descended and stood at the door of the tabernacle and the Lord talked with Moses and all the people saw the cloudy pillar stand at the tabernacle door and all the people rose up and worshiped every man in his tent door and the lord spake unto moses face to face as a man speaketh unto his friend and he turned again unto the camp but his servant joshua the son of nun a young man departed not out of the tabernacle so god already had something very special because when you uh, go into the word of God, you see wherever Moses was, even though um, um, Joshua could not approach fully because he had 
up to a certain uh, area, even those that, that the 70 that were, uh, they were chosen by God to represent like the council. So whatever had to be done, they had to go and speak to the people. Okay. Warning concerning the Holy of Holies. Let's see Leviticus chapter 16 to 16 to. And the Lord said unto Moses, speak unto Aaron, thy brother, that he come not at all times into the holy place within the veil before the mercy seat which is upon the ark, that he may die not. For I... Give me one second, because I just turned the wrong... Okay. For I will appear in the cloud upon the mercy seat. Now, um, you notice he was the high priest. But he was told that he cannot enter whenever he wanted. And this is the same message uh, that we have up until this day. We can't do always whatever we want. There will be times where the Lord will reveal to you something you must do in a particular way. And then next time he will tell you because, you know, he does uh, uh, various things. He's not a boring God. He does varieties. That's the reason why we have different uh, gifts of the spirit. Even a person that may, may be able to interpret has to know when to keep quiet. And it says it in the word of God. Okay. Now, it says, fire foretells the light of the world. The pillar of fire illuminating the way for the Israelite nation was a foreshadowing of Jesus Christ, the Messiah, who came to save the world from sin. Let's look at Luke 3.16. Whatever we find in the Old Testament has to connect with the New Testament. Whatever you go in, even though we are... Uh, the New Testament Christians, we have to make sure that something backs up what we are believing in. We can't believe whatever we want. We cannot do whatever we want. 316. 316. John answered, saying unto them all, I indeed baptize you with water but one mightier than i cometh the latchet of whose shoes i am not worthy to unloose he shall baptize you with the holy spirit and with fire so what does fire do you light up something a match you have light there right symbol of fire purification or god's presence when you have a close relationship with God. You will feel that. It, 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 his presence has to be uh, uh, felt. It's just like when you have a good relationship with someone. You feel that, that they are who they really are. Uh, symbol of light stands for holiness, truth, and understanding. Now the light of the world. Then Jesus again spoke to them saying, I am the light of the world. Whoever follows me will never walk in darkness, but will have the light of light. And also John, 1 John 1.5. 1 John 1.5. This then is the message which we have heard of him and declare unto you. That God is light and in him is no darkness at all. Okay, so now, just like the pillar of uh, fire guided the Israelites, the light Jesus brought continues to guide and protect Christians. 
the book of Revelation, chapter 21. These are symbolisms, 21, 23. And the city had no need of the sun, neither of the moon, to shine in it, for the glory of God did lighten it, and the Lamb is the light thereof. So now we know why everything shines, right? And why... It is important for, it speaks of the eyes are the, is the light for the, for the body. You know, whatever we focus on, uh, when we focus on things, that's why God has given us, you know, to be able to see there's light, light all over the place, right? We can distinguish it day to night. And, um. And it says that if, if the light you have is darkness, then it contaminates the whole, the whole body. Okay. The tabernacle in the wilderness, it was a portable place of worship that God commanded to be built after he rescued them from slavery in Egypt. It was used, uh, from a year after they crossed the Red Sea. King Solomon built the first temple in Jerusalem, a period of 400 years. So it took a while from where, uh, what God had established into a more modern time. Now we don't have that type of temple. We go into a temple, right? Into an edifice. But the most important part is this here. That's why, uh, the Lord says that we are temple of the Holy Spirit through his word. Okay, um, I'm going to give like a few uh, scriptures where it speaks on the tabernacle. Let's go to Exodus. I'm just going to read them because there's, there's a lot of scriptures. So if you have time, like to write them down, I'll pause and I'll, and I'll, uh, I'll just give them off. Uh, it speaks of, of the tabernacle in, uh, chapters 25 to 27. That is 25, 26, 27 chapters, 35 to 40 in Leviticus 8, 10. 16, 9, 19, 13, 31, 30, verse 47. Let's look at Joshua 22, 29. 20. It said, God forbid that we should rebel against the Lord and turn this day from the following the Lord to build an altar for burnt offering, for meat offerings, or for sacrifices beside the altar of the Lord, our God, that is before his tabernacle. So tabernacle was also considered a place of meeting. Meeting what? Well, he would congregate his presence within the ark to meet with his people. Where God dwelt among his people on earth. That was always his intention. Uh, when Adam and Eve were created, his intention was for them to be part of that council. Uh, the multiplying of families that would worship that would uh, have friendship with him. Names in the Bible for the tabernacle. You have the tabernacle of the congregation. Wilderness tabernacle. Tab tabernacle of witness. The witnesses were actually the Ten Commandments. Tent of witness and tent of meeting. In Mount Sinai, 
Moses received instruction from the Lord. Tabernacle and all its elements were to be constructed. People were to donate the materials from spoils they had received from the Egyptians. You can find that in Exodus 35, 20, 29. And I had gotten into some uh, information and I questioned. Uh, not everybody was allowed to be part of that building. There were certain people that were pointed out to do certain things. Even women were given uh, uh, the capacity of art uh, to to do uh, with the uh, with the goats, uh, the material that was the cover up on top uh, to create that roof, like on that skeleton uh, uh, wood. So not anybody could could be doing this. Okay, the entire tabernacle compound was 75 feet by 150 feet. Um, enclosed by a court fence of linen curtains attached to poles and fastened to the ground with ropes and stakes. I was able, many, many years ago, I think it was in 19, maybe 87, uh, when I went to Puerto Rico and I was taking classes, my first year class, and the Lord guided me to make a model. He did it 25 by 37, I think it was. And he gave me the instructions because I was saying, okay, so uh, uh, what are the colors? And I went and I bought uh, the uh, sprays of gold, of bronze, of silver. Silver were the, uh, the tension cords that, that held up uh, uh, curtains on their uh, bases and stuff like that. It was very interesting. Uh, more than just to get a good uh, mark, uh, it was very important to me. I was really beginning to know uh, more on those things, more intricate things of the Lord, uh, to learn his His way of, of thinking, his heart, you know? So at the front was a 30 foot wide gate of the court made of purple and scarlet yarn woven into twined linen. That's the area where the women, uh, I couldn't even imagine how beautiful that must have been. But you know, the front, there were four curtains and those four curtains symbolize uh, the gospels, just like you would find later on what upheld, you know, the structure were five pillars, and you would find that in Ephesians chapter 4, 11, if you're curious enough to, uh, to look for that information. Inside the courtyard was the brazen altar, or altar of burnt offering, where offerings of animal sacrifices were presented. My, my next uh, uh, theme or topic will be of the uh, brazen altar, and we'll have a couple of illustrations as well. The bronze laver was used by the priest to perform ceremonial purification washings of their hands and feet. Uh, I had spoken about that, but I'll be doing right after the uh, brazen altar or the altar of bronze. Um, I will be uh, speaking on a little bit on the lavers. In the rear of the compound was a tabernacle tent itself, a 15 by 45 foot structure made of an acacia wood skeleton overlaid with gold covered with layers made of goat hair, ram, ram skins dyed red and badger skins. Now there's a, a kind of like a, a, I wouldn't say a controversy, but I had to question, I would remain with this badger skin and not so much of a dolphin skin or, or uh, a sea lion skin. I, I couldn't imagine that uh, it would be of the sea. I tell you why I consider badger to be the right uh, interpretation. Because of the fact that badger, badger is not a, a, a pretty animal. 
And it just so happens that there's a part in Isaiah where it says that in the way that they, uh, his visage was marred, uh, they're saying uh, in uh, Isaiah 53, you know, there's nothing like attractive about him. How could it be? I always say, how could it be attractive when they pulled his face apart by pulling the beard and 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 they marred his face that's what the word says the acacia wood is a a, a non-corrupted type it's even antibacterial uh, by the way it's it's a uh, shittim wood it's made the wood from shittim okay the entry to the tent was made through a screen of blue, purple, and scarlet yarn woven into fine twined linen. The door always faced east. The holy place, 15 by 30 foot chamber, contained a table with shoe bread that would be on its right and on its left, like I had said in, in the prior uh, uh, program, uh, the, uh, the lampstand was on, the, on its left side. At the end of that room was the altar of incense. Uh, the way it's explained at the end, if you're looking this way, but actually it's to the front of the Holy of Holies. It would be right in front and there would be this curtain because the curtain symbolized no access yet to the presence of God. And mind you, uh, with the high priest, he had to... He had to offer up a sacrifice for himself, recognizing that he is imperfect, that he is a sinner, before he could do anything. And this was done uh, once a year. And thank God the Lord Jesus Christ uh, ended all that every year. Can you imagine how much people sin within a year? Imagine if they die without their salvation. Okay. Then... Um, the lampstand, the or menorah, fashioned after an almond tree to the left with its six arms and a centerpiece were hammered, solid gold piece. This uh, typifies uh, not only the integrity, but also the sufferings, right? The most holy place or holy of holies was 15 by 15 foot. The sacred chamber with the Ark of the Covenant, a wooden box overlaid with gold, with statues of two cherubims on top, facing each other with their wings touching. The lid or mercy seat was where God met with his people on the Day of Atonement. The high priest presented himself once a year, first for his sins, then for the people. And then, of course, the inside the lower level of the ark was the manna, uh, the table of, of I'm sorry, the tablets of the Ten Commandments, and also Aaron's rod. And we understand that that typifies, it's symbolic to giving fruit. That's what the Lord looks for, giving fruit. I'm just getting there. <laughs> okay, so let me read. Aaron's rod. I always, I love, I really and truly love this. It is, it's a, um, a very personal kind of, um, relationship when God gives you a position. Numbers 17. He will always lift your, you up in midst of whomever thinks that you're not even worthy. The important thing is that God, God believes if you are worthy. So 17, 5 to 8. And it shall come to pass that the man's rod whom I shall choose shall blossom and I will make to cease uh, from the murmurings of the children of Israel whereby they murmur against you. And Moses spake unto the children of Israel and every one of their princes gave him a rod apiece for each prince one 
according to their fathers' houses, even twelve rods, and the rod of Aaron was among their rods. And Moses laid up the rods before the Lord in the tabernacle of witness. And it came to pass that on the morrow Moses went into the tabernacle of witness, and behold, the rod of Aaron for the house of Levi was budded and brought forth buds and bloomed blossoms and yielded almonds. And Moses brought out all the rods from before the Lord unto all the children of Israel. And they looked and took every man his rod. And the Lord said unto Moses, Bring Aaron's rod again before the testimony to be kept for a token against the rebels. And thou shalt quiet, excuse me, and thou shalt quiet, Take away their murmurings from me that they die not. And Moses did so as the Lord, as the Lord commanded him, so did he. And the children of Israel spake unto Moses, saying, Behold, we die, we perish, we all perish. Whosoever cometh anything near unto the tabernacle of the Lord shall die. Shall we be consumed with dying? Why is it that when people are out of the will of God, we're going to enter now and understand a portal tabernacle. It was situated in the very center of camp. The 12 tribes encamped around it. And we will see uh, number one, which are the banners. And this is very, very interesting because this has to, uh, this has to, uh, it is the blessings that Jacob spoke over his children. I'm going to see if I, if I remember the scripture, where exactly it is that he speaks over them. This is a little bit before the beginning of the Exodus. Um, okay. Chapter 49 of Genesis. And Jacob called unto his sons and said, Gather yourselves together that I may tell you that which shall befall you in the last days. Gather yourselves together and hear ye sons of Jacob and hearken unto Israel, your father. Reuben, thou art my firstborn, my might, and the beginning of my strength, the excellency of dignity and the excellency of power. Unstable as water, thou shalt not excel, because thou wentest up to thy father's bed, then defilest thou it. He went up to my couch. That was... He took one of his uh, concubines. Simeon and Levi are brethren. Instruments of cruelty are in their habitations. O oh, my soul, come not thou into their secret, unto their assembly. Mine honor, be not thou united. For in their anger they slew a man, and in their self-will they dig down a wall, but not only a man, because what happened was uh, Dina, their sister, uh, was, well, was raped, really. But the boy fell in love and was willing to recompense. I go like this, if you call that a recompense. And what they did was, well, we cannot mix with strangers. So uh, I tell you what, uh, you get circumcised this way, you're recognized, and then we will give sister to you. And what it was, after they got circumcised, when they were into those days where they were feeling it for real, them two brothers got together 
and they killed not only the young boy, not only the father, but that town was wiped out. And that's the reason why Jacob, it, within the, uh, the, the, the blessing to his children, he also lets them know um, how they have faltered. Cursed be their anger, for it was fierce, and their wrath, for it was cruel. I will divide them in Jacob and scatter them in Israel. Judah, thou art he whom thy brethren shall praise. Thy hand shall be in the neck of thine enemies. Thy father's children shall bow down before thee. Judah is a lion's whelp from the prey, son. Thou art gone up. He stooped down, he couched as a lion, and as an old lion who shall rouse him up. Like, we speak about the Lord Jesus Christ. He is the lion from the tribe of Judah. So that there was a blessing on that. And plus, the Lord had promised David that a king would uh, be in the throne forever. And for him to be in the throne forever, he would have to be Almighty God, right? So it says, The scepter shall not depart from Judah, nor a lawgiver from between his feet until Shiloh come. And Shiloh, excuse me, Shiloh is also a shadow of the Messiah coming. That's the name that they give him. And unto him shall the gathering of the people be, binding his pole unto the vine and his ass's pole unto the choice vine. He washed his garments in wine and his clothes in the blood of grapes. His eyes shall be red with wine and his teeth white with milk. And let me tell you something, that is describing Isaiah chapter 63, one to six. So when he's coming, he's coming back in wrath and he is definitely going to deal with the nations. Zebulun shall dwell at the haven of the sea and he shall be for a haven of ships and his Border shall be unto Zidon. Issachar is a strong ass, pouting down between two burdens. And he saw that rest good and the land that it was pleasant, and bowed his shoulder to bear, and became a servant unto tribute. Dan shall judge his people as one of the tribes of Israel. Dan shall be a serpent by the way that an adder in the path that biteth the horse heels, so that his rider shall fall backward. I have waited for thy salvation, O Lord. Gad, a troop, shall overcome him, but he shall overcome at last. Out of Asher, his bread shall be fat, and he shall yield royal dainties. Naphtali is a hind let loose, he giveth goodly words. Joseph is a fruitful bough, even a fruitful bough by a well, whose branches run over the, the wall. The archers have sorely grieved him and shot at him and hated him. And he's talking about when the brothers left him in that, uh, that well. And a lot of people always saying that he was sold by his brothers. That's not true. One has to read the scriptures. They were still questioning a lot of things. They left him there when Reuben went to go back to get his brother because they were talking about selling. That was in their heart, but they did not do it. So we have to assume that, that someone that's down there in a well is going to yell out for help. And came the Midianites. And Midianites, it just so happens that our in the line of that family because the Midianites Midian is the son of Abraham with uh with uh Satura and they were um Arabs okay now you'll notice in those uh beautiful uh designs they had their they're what they call the standard in Spanish, estándar. 
And that identified not only the prince, but the house that, that they belonged to. Okay, I'm going to read uh, the amount of people. I'm, I'm, I always, in, in the Bible, when I see a, uh, numbers, I like to write it down so I, I can focus on it. It's very interesting why the Lord does what he does. Okay, so it says that the portable tabernacle was situated in the very center of camp. Twelve tribes encamped around it. Now you have to figure it out. Uh, he's right in the center of it. And there are thousands of feet on each side because the presence of God is no joke. People have today can't figure that out. We have finite minds. We can't reason with it. And I would like for you to see after I read the whole uh, amount of people, you will understand why God positioned them the way he did. So we have in each cluster, there's three tribes, right? Three, six, nine, and 12. You have the North, you have Dan, 62,700. Asher had 41,500. Naphtali, had 53,400, giving a total of 157,600 men. We're talking about men. We're not talking about the women and children. Gad, who uh, covered South, was 45,650. Simeon was 59,300. Reuben was 46,500, a total of 151,000. 450 men on the east was judah and issachar and zabulon they were the biggest judah had 74,600 issachar had 64,400 zabulon had 67,400 with a total of 186,400 on the west side was benjamin 40,500, Manasseh, 32,200, and Ephraim, 35,400, giving them a total of 108,100. The whole total was 603,550, almost a million, almost a million. I would like for my son to illustrate number two photo so you can understand how beautiful is that? And we'll get to see all the symbolisms just looking at, at that. Why at the east and how they were situated because they were not allowed to look towards the east because the east is where the sun rises and goes down. Too much uh, worship of the sun. So during its use, the tabernacle was moved many times. Everything would be packed onto ox carts when the people left. But the Ark of the Covenant was hand carried by the Levites like we learned in the last time, boy. Because even when he thought he was doing a favor, when that came off, that Lamborghini, which nobody asked them to, to hook up, Uzzah paid a very big price. The tabernacle's journey at Sinai, it stood 38 years at Kadesh. After Joshua and the Hebrews crossed the Jordan River into the Promised Land, the tabernacle stood at Gilgal for seven years. Next home was Shiloh, where it remained until the time of the judges. Later set up in Nob and Gibeon, King David erected the tabernacle at Jerusalem and had the ark brought from Perez Uzzah, the name that he gave when Uzzah lost his life, and set in it. Tabernacle and all its components, symbolic meanings, foreshadowing of the perfect tabernacle, Jesus Christ, who is Emmanuel, that means God with us. The scriptures points to the coming Messiah, 
who fulfilled God's loving plan for the salvation of the world. Uh, I, I love the expression, for God so loved the world that he gave his only begotten son. The, the heart of God wanting to uh, rectify, to reconcile. It was in his heart to reconcile. So the angel of uh, Jehovah is the one that uh, we can very easily just go to Isaiah chapter 6 where he says who shall go for us and then we know that the most beautiful person in the whole world uh paid a price for us that we did not deserve a high priest who sat down in place of honor beside the throne of the majestic god in heaven but he had that place from the very beginning he ministers in the heavenly tabernacle, the true place of worship that was built by the Lord and not by human. That is, first of all, it was a virgin who gave birth. So I can imagine, I know because um, I took up nursing and I saw this beautiful video and it shows like a little, uh, a little lump of, of blood and how everything just starts starts gathering but the cilia pushes it and then it goes against gravity because the trumps are like this so it goes inside and it drops into the womb well she had it placed she had it transplanted right there the power of the holy spirit did that he ministers in the heavenly tabernacle, the true place of worship that was built by the Lord and not by human hands. The high priest is required to offer gifts and sacrifices serving in a system of worship that is only a shadow of the real one in heaven. One day we will experience that. Jesus, our high priest, the ministry that is far superior than any old priesthood intercedes for us a far better covenant with God based on better promises Hebrews chapter 8 1 to 6 God continues to dwell among his people but an even more intimate way after Jesus ascension into heaven he sent the Holy Spirit to live inside every Christian can be can be okay so we had 12 tribes I'm gonna finalize with with these things it says finally the israelites entered the promised land but they had to drive out the pagan tribes who already lived there even though they were divided into 12 tribes the israelites recognized that they were unified people under god the number 12 represents perfection we're going to see that in revelation it speaks of the elders, there's 24 elders. So you say, okay, 12, 12, who do they represent? And you have Israel, right? And all the Christians, that's a representation symbolic of those who are even going to judge angels as the word says. The number 12 represents perfection as well as God's authority. It stands for a solid foundation for government and complete peace. Symbolic references to the 12 tribes of Israel abound throughout the Bible. Then um, uh, Moses built an altar with 12 pillars representing the tribes in Exodus 24, 4. There were 12 stones on the high priest ephod or holy vest, each representing one tribe. Joshua set up a memorial of 12 stones after the people crossed the Jordan River, but there were also placed in the river. When King Solomon built the first temple in Jerusalem, a huge washing bowl called the sea sat on 12 bronze bulls and 12 bronze lions guarded the steps. The prophet Elijah built an altar of 12 stones on Mount Carmel. When he went, the altar was uh, was all destroyed. He had to build it up again. And that's what happens with us nowadays. We need to make sure that our altar is not in shambles. 
we need to have construction. If 12, 12 uh, is, is the, um, uh, the number of God, it's a completeness. Okay. Jesus Christ, who came from the tribe of Judah, chose 12 apostles, signifying that he was ushering in new Israel. Of course. And the, uh, the stability afterwards when he comes personally. After feeding the 5,000, the apostles picked up 12 baskets of leftover food. And we know that in another one, it was seven. Those are his numbers. Jesus said to them, I tell you the truth at the renewal of all things. When the son of man sits on his glorious throne, you who have followed me will also sit on 12 thrones, judging the 12 tribes of Israel. That's found in Matthew 19, 28. In the prophetic book of Revelation, an angel shows John, the holy city, Jerusalem, coming down out of heaven. It had a great high wall with 12 gates, with 12 angels at the gates. On the gates were written the names of the 12 tribes of Israel. Revelation 21, 12. And over the centuries, the 12 tribes of Israel uh, fell apart by marrying foreigners. That was in the olden times, but mainly through the conquest of hostile invaders. The Assyrians overran part of the kingdom. Then in 586 BC, the Babylonians attacked, carrying thousands of Israelites into captivity in Babylon. And we can find that all in the book of uh, Jeremiah and in the book of Daniel chapter 10, where we find him, he's struggling 21 days for the fasting. Uh, he, he's already about 90 years old. He went in as a youth and uh, he's asking. Now, I know because it says it and he, he, he calls him the prophet Jeremiah understood that uh, there was an ending to those 70 years through the uh, governing of uh, Nebuchadnezzar. Not only Nebuchadnezzar, Nabonides, and, um, or Nabonides, I don't know how, how uh, the Americans uh, pronounce that. Uh, then you had Belshazzar, the one that got all, uh, all his invites drunk while he was drunk, and they took the, uh, the uh, cups and all these uh, sacred vessels from the temple that they had taken when they took over Israel. And that's when that writing on the wall. So this is the end of the, uh, that of the tabernacle. Next one, uh, I'll be doing, uh, the, the brazen altar, then the labor. Then I'm going to, uh, show the, uh, the way, uh, the parts of the uh, the beautiful vestments of the uh, priest and high priest. Uh, it has been a, a, a struggle. A struggle because, you know, one has to uh, go in and, and, and check things out and check with the Bible and stuff like that. And sometimes the body's not uh, feeling too great, but God has given us the... Uh, the victory over these things and uh, try together with my son because he's the one that perfects the things. He'll show it from his end. I'll speak on it on this end and we try to, you know, get together as one mind to, to make it easier for people to understand. By nature, we, we hear things and when we see things, it seems to sink in a little bit better. We try to make it as uh, clear as we can and simple so that everyone can understand, even a child. Um, and now the most important part after all this, the most important part is uh, the invitation to accept the Lord. I don't know what your condition is. Um, maybe you're kind of flowing away maybe you've had it already you haven't seen anything in particular my my uh 
my thoughts are always this, the closer you get to God, the more you're open to, to him, the more you tell him how you feel. He is an understanding father. He's the creator and the designer of, of this body. Many times the body, many times the emotions, the spiritual aspects, they all kind of get all discombobulated. That's my favorite word. And um, it, it, it leaves us baffled, exhausted, and everything like that. But he is very personal. Before I started here, my mind wasn't all that clear. I had to battle with certain conditions, but it doesn't impede. If I have a relationship with God, I can tell him, look, I need your strength. I need a clear mind. I need the situation handled. I can't take this like this. He is understanding and he will. He says, call on me and I will answer. That's positive. So I would like to lead you to this prayer. It's very simple. God, I have sinned greatly in my life. I need restoration. I I'm tired, tired of this lifestyle. I ask for your forgiveness. And I thank you that I am given Jesus as my savior that he died on the cross. I do not need to die in my sins. I accept his sin sacrifice. He washes me with his blood. I ask the daily uh, walk with your Holy Spirit, that he may guide me to the truth of your word and that you may write my name in the book of life. I ask you these things wholehearted in Jesus mighty name. Father, I give you thanks. I ask Lord that we can continue up to where Lord it's possible. I thank you for my son, for all he does to help me out in the program. I thank you for all those who enter Lord. Who sometimes they don't catch it right away, but later on they might go in, they might leave uh, some kind of a message to me, Lord, which gives me um, like, like strength to go on, Lord. It's all worth it, Lord. It's worth, Lord, people being saved. It's worth people being healed by you, my God. I ask you, Lord, that you may glorify yourself, especially in these latter times. There's a lot of hurt confused people, people without jobs, people whose homes are falling apart, Lord, and they don't know where to turn. I ask you, Lord, that you may glorify yourself, that you may reveal yourself in dreams and visions, Father, that they may know that you are real, my God. I ask you these things, Lord, in Jesus' mighty name. This has been Rosemary Santiago from On Wings of an Eagle. Please, don't allow yourself to be consumed. Try God. Get close to him. Speak to him like you would a daughter with a father. Maybe you didn't have a father that you could talk with. You can be sure that he is going to listen. That's what the word of God is all about. Please ask God to lead you to a church that will teach you the truth of his word from Genesis to Revelation. God bless you.